I'm so thankful for this opportunity to be before you all tonight to speak and to share God's word uh, in the night chapel. My name, uh, it's already been said, uh, and if you haven't met you personally yet, my name is Josiah Delgado. Um, <laughs> I am a uh, I'm fourth year here at Jessup. Technically should be a senior. I'm a junior plus. It's all good. I have more time to, to do better in my grades. Am I right? Um, <laughs> I'm majoring in youth ministry to pursue my calling that God has given me to be a youth pastor one day, to shepherd a church in that way. Uh, in addition to this, I'm involved in many other ministries here on campus at Jessup. One of them being, and one of my favorites personally, is singing in the university choir and orchestra. And then you see our people, hey! Awesome. I love it. Such a great family there. I'm so thankful I get to be part of it for a fourth year again. This past weekend, actually, I got to go down with UCO to Skywalker Ranch. And if you don't know what Skywalker Ranch is, that used to be George Lucas's um, personal kind of getaway place for not only himself, but also for fellow filmmakers and people who have just the stresses of making movies and to get away to not only that, but to also record scores and soundtracks and do everything that goes with making a movie. And we, the small university in Rockland, California, got to go again for the fourth year and record two albums there. And it's such an awesome opportunity. I'm so thankful I got to be a part of it. So kind of crazy weekend going into my first night ever speaking at a chapel, let alone a Monday night chapel. Um, but I'm so thankful that I still have my voice and I still have my smile on my face, so it's going to be a good night. Um, but I was thinking, just from the experiences I've had, not only in UCO, but also just throughout my entire life. Um, like um, Taylor just said, like I am one of the Monday Night Chapel worship leaders with Taylor, co-leading with him. And it has been such a beautiful, amazing thing I've gotten to be a part of, not only just of a worship team, but now actually leading for the first time in my life. It's been a very interesting dynamic shift for me. Uh, kind of a little scary, because uh, I'm so used to being behind the drum set and not with a guitar in my hand and singing. Uh, but it seems like God has been using um, not only Taylor and I, but also the rest of our team that we've been able to find, and or more so, they came to us, and it's just been so, so amazing. And all of this, just an entire life leading up to this moment, has got me thinking about worship. Like, worship in itself. I, I mean, we say that a lot, especially in the Christian world. In church, you've been like, you probably hear like, oh my gosh, the worship is so amazing today. Or if you're kind of a stickler, you're like, ah, it could have been better. You know, I wish they played maybe like, I don't know, some new stuff. I don't know. Anyway, but we hear worship thrown around, that word, that term thrown out so often. And even tonight, we have the worship band come up to play worship songs to lead us in worship. And I hear that word so often in my mind, so often going through my head. But truly, what is worship? Not only that, but specifically talking about singing, why do we worship God through singing? Why do we worship through music? Have you ever thought about that? Have you actually taken the time to sit down and just think, you know, it's kind of interesting. We all sit in this big room, and we listen to this band that plays songs that we all sing together. And it's not exactly a concert because we're not singing to them, at least hopefully not, but we are singing songs about a God that we read about in a very, very old book written by over 40 authors. And we do it continuously every week, especially here in chapel, in church, week in, week out. We sing. We do worship. But why? What is the purpose of worship? Specifically, why do we worship God through singing? So tonight we'll be asking ourselves three questions. And my hope and my prayer for myself, but also for every one of you, is that we are reminded tonight and that we know the purpose of singing, of musical worship in the life of the church, in the life of believers, and for every single one of us here tonight. That it's not about whatever band or whoever stands on the stage. It's not about whoever stands in the audience. But it's all encompassed and comes back to the God who is holy and worthy of our praise. I'm going to pray again because I love talking to God and because I know for him he gives me peace before I come before him to speak his word. So let's pray. Abba Father, thank you so much for this night. Lord, you are holy. May your kingdom come, your will be done tonight, God. May the words I speak not be my own, and may they be from your Holy Spirit within me. You, God, working through me to share your truth tonight. It doesn't matter what I look like, God, but I pray that whatever happens tonight, that it be straight from your word, it be straight from your truth, God, because you are the way, truth, and the life. 
And Jesus, we thank you so much that through your sacrifice, we have come, we are able to come to the Father. And God, I can stand here before you declaring, before everyone here, God, declaring the truth that you are alive, that you are living, and that you save, God. That our salvation is found in you alone. Help us to understand, help us to find out why we sing to you, God, the beauty of it, the power of it. And I just thank you so much again for this opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. First question, what is worship? Again, I kind of already started a little bit rant about that. You know, what is worship really? Because we hear that a lot, especially thrown out in the context of singing. But truly, what is worship? Growing up, I was very blessed to be in a lot of opportunities to experience uh, being on a worship team, playing drums, not only from middle school all the way through high school in my youth group, but also in what I like to call big church, you know, normal services with all the adults and everything. Um, I haven't really spoken about my youth group days in a while, so if, even though I technically am an adult now, I still refer to it as big church. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, but I... I have been very blessed to have tons of those opportunities to play and to experience what it's like to be in a worship band. And again, while I say worship, and we talk about it all the time in chapel, it begs the question, is all that worship is just the times we sing before the chapel speaker comes up to say something, before the pastor comes to share what the Lord has given him? Romans 12, 1 says this. If I can find the paper that had the memory verse for us. There it is. Romans 12.1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Paul, the author of Romans, states here that worship is offering ourselves as living sacrifices. What does this mean? In put in a very concise sentence, worship is not merely found in the words we say, in the notes we sing, not even the things we do. True worship starts within us with a focused heart on giving everything that we are to God. Yes, singing is worship, it's definitely a part of worship, but it is only a fruit of a heart that is given completely to God. I make this distinction because it's so easy to sing. It's so easy to say things, for us to do things, and yet for our heart to be so far removed from it. One struggle of mine as a young man of God right now is lying, which I know I'm telling the truth now, which I'm kind of working on it, uh, is definitely lying. I know sometimes I would say that maybe it's more of a matter of integrity. Like, I would, I would love to have good intentions. Like, oh, man, I'll be there for you. Or, oh, yeah, um, let's get coffee this day. You know, I'll put this time down, and I'll text you, you know, to make sure that we get that down. And then the week goes by, and I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, dude. Like, I'm just really bad at answering texts. And it's not simply just that, but I know I sometimes deliberately lie to mask that I really don't want to do what is asked of me. Or when I sing songs to bring it very specifically for worship, for what we're doing tonight, talking about tonight, is that I can sing songs like, my heart is yours, my heart is yours, take it all, take it all, my life is in your hands, yet go back and go do things that is not reflective of a heart that's given to God, things that is reflective of the old Josiah before he met Jesus. And see, this is why worship needs to start from a changed heart, which gives birth to the true acts of worship and righteous deeds and honest singing. So that in a very, very small nutshell that came off a tree that was on a huge mountain, that is worship. That is where worship is. It's just a changed heart that is given completely to God. And so to avoid confusion from now on, since I've already kind of messed up a couple times, whenever I say worship from this point on, unless I make it specifically correlate to something else, I'll be referring to singing. So worship equals singing for the rest of the night when I'm done talking. Sound cool? Cool. Awesome. I'm glad I'm still, you guys, I still got you guys. Okay, cool. <laughs> anyway, second question. Why should we worship through music? And I know that for me, like, I just love singing. Like, kind of 
put aside just, you know, worship time right now when it comes to in chapel or in church. Like, I just love singing. Like, not even just in the shower when I'm by myself, which I know I'm very loud and sometimes at risk of slipping because I start dancing. But I just love singing so much, especially just in the times when a song comes to my head. Like, it could be any random song. Like, don't you dare look back. And then I keep going on. And it just doesn't matter what song it is. I just love singing. It doesn't have to pertain technically to a worship song. I just really love singing. I know that a lot of you do too. Like even people that technically don't know how to sing, they love singing. And it's not nothing against them. But I just know sometimes like whether they chose to or not, just tone deaf. People who just physically don't know how to sing. I don't have anything against them. No, no. Wait, let, me, let me rephrase this. So I'm... I should have asked permission before I said this, but I'm going to try to say this without um, pointing this particular person out. So, <laughs> oh, okay, this is, this is going really down here. Okay, let's just go on. Let's go on from this. Okay, anyway, so I have a really awesome friend that I've been able to know for a while, and this person just loves singing. This person loves music. But unfortunately, and this person acknowledges it, just doesn't know how to find the right note to sing. But besides that point, it doesn't actually stop him from singing. And you see, that's a very awesome and beautiful thing because this person doesn't care about what everyone else is thinking around them. This person, all the person is thinking about is just that they want to sing. And specifically, what's really encouraging about this particular person is that they sing so loud and so proud in worship because they know they're not singing for the person besides them, for the people in front of them, for the band. They're singing to God. And God is smiling so big when this person does that. Because he understands that it's not about knowing the right notes. It's not about having the best voice. You know, worship, again, comes from the heart, a changed heart. And no matter whether what comes out sounds pretty to our ears, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful sound to our God. So again, this brings us to the question, why should we worship through singing? And it's not so much a question of why, per se, because it starts from really a who. Who do we sing to when we worship? Who do we worship when we're singing? And I know we kind of already said it. Most of us probably grew up in church. They know the answer is... Cool. Let's try again. They know that the answer is... Yeah. Awesome. There we go. Hey, bring you back to Sunday school answers. Okay, cool. Uh, but no... The answer is God or Jesus. And yet we say God, and that really honestly doesn't fully encapsulate who God is. Because God truly is just a title. God can mean any type of deity. Like when you say God, we know probably most for, for most part that we're talking about the God of the Bible, the God of the Christian faith. But you say God to someone else in another country, another part of the United States sometimes, they can have a different picture of who God is. So who is the God of the Bible? Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 through 7. God himself tells us his name, his actual name, to Moses. And we see it here. And it says, and he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. So God himself says, I'm the Lord. And in this passage, if you look at the actual original languages written in Hebrew, the name that we derive from it through tons of history and tons of hard work is Yahweh. Yahweh. Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. So this is the God we sing to is Yahweh. That's his name. So whenever we really want to refer to God, the God of the Bible, the God that I serve because he has called me, that is Yahweh. Psalm 100, 
which I believe was spoken uh, before worship started, is this. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Yahweh is worthy to be addressed with shouts of praise of joy. He is worthy to be worshipped with gladness, to come before him with joyful songs. And we need to know that Yahweh is God. He is God, and he is the creator of everything, and we are his. And we are to enter before him with thanksgiving, with praise, because he is good, his love endures forever, and his faithfulness lasts throughout all generations. This is the God we serve. This is the God we sing to. And in the end of the Bible, one day, even right now as we speak, there are angels and creatures around Yahweh proclaiming, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Again, you are worthy, our Lord and God. And this is now the 24 elders before him, as John records in Revelation chapter 4, verses 8 and 11. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. This is Yahweh. This is the God we sing to. Ephesians chapter 2. It also talks about another thing of our God, of Yahweh. Ephesians chapter 2. It actually talks about us. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through whenever I finish. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. As for me, I was dead in my transgressions and sins. As for you, you were dead in in your transgressions and sins. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. That's Satan. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, this is speaking about believers now, like the rest, those who do not know God personally, we were by nature objects of wrath. I was an object of wrath. Verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that I have been saved. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God, Yahweh, raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from ourselves. This is not not from me. It is the gift of God. Not by anything I can do. Not by works so that I can't boast. So that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, good, good works, excuse me, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. This is the God we sing to. This is the God. This is Yahweh. You see, what this whole passage is pertaining to is the gospel. You see, I, Josiah, smiley face and everything, I was condemned to hell because of the things I've done against the Lord. For the things I've said, for the lies I've told, for the things I've seen, the sins I've partaken in with these hands, where I've gone to where the Lord did not will for me to go, where he would not want me to go because it was not glorifying to him. I deserved eternal separation from him. For the wages of sin, of my sin, the things I've done against God, is deserving of death. And that is the same for every single one of us. It is the human condition. It's called sin. Everybody has it. And that's the reason why that when we start picking fights, we start 
talking about politics and it seems like no answer is right is because we're all technically wrong. It's because we're all broken. We're all in need of saving. And the thing is, like it said here, that there is nothing I could do. It's, I'm not saved by anything I can do. I can't do anything to pull me out of that place of sin. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. God knew our standing before him, our natural standing before him, that we chose to disobey him. We chose to go against his perfect plan for us. And because of that, now we stood in condemnation because God is a holy God and that we rightfully deserved that judgment. But God, who is rich in mercy, in grace and love, who is faithful, it was pleasing to him. It was to his glory that he would send his only son, Jesus Christ, completely perfect, without sin, the perfect lamb of God, to die the death that I so rightfully deserved, to be driven through with nails, through his hands, through his feet, that were meant for me, were meant for you. And he died that death. And it was the worst thing that ever happened to mankind in the history of mankind. But it doesn't end there because if that was where the gospel ended, it wouldn't be called the gospel because that's not good news at all. We still remain in our sin. But the truth is, Jesus did rose again from the dead three days later, and those of us who now know him, we have a personal relationship with, with God because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross, we are made alive with Christ. We are saved, not because of anything we could ever do, but because of his grace. This is the God we sing to. This is Yahweh. This is Jesus, the Holy Spirit. Triune God, three in one. I know it kind of blows our minds because we can't fully comprehend it. But it's such an awesome truth to know that God is faithful, he's loving, he's merciful, he's just. He's worthy of our praise. So bring it back to the question, why do we sing? We sing because of who God is, because of his faithfulness, because of his love, because of the gospel, the truth that we were screwed. We couldn't do anything on our own. And God in his love for us saw it would fit for him to put upon our punishment, Jesus Christ, the only perfect one. And yet from this topsy-turvy, just upside-down thing of the perfect one dying for the sinful one, we now have come to know Christ alive again through him. So we sing because God is worthy of it. Because once you actually know Christ, you just can't help but sing. You just can't help but dance. And you don't care if you could slip in the shower because God is so worthy. <laughs> this brings us to our final question, which is why should we worship through singing? Oh, I actually just did that one. It's actually the next one on the page that, excuse me. <laughs> it's why do we sing? Why should we sing? What should we sing? What should we be singing? If God is so worthy of praise, if we should be singing to God, then what should we be singing? Because honestly, I could just leave it here and like just leave you guys with just God is worthy, God is holy, boom. And honestly, I think that would kind of be fine. But... We should know what we should sing if God is so worthy of praise. Does he call us to worship him, to sing to him in ways that he calls us to? Which leads me to my final verse, Colossians 3.16. And it says this, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Now, there is this message by this guy named Sinclair Ferguson, awesome man of God, and he titled it, Paul's Singing Lesson. If you didn't know that Paul gave singing lessons to the Bible, he does, and he did, and this is it. Uh, Colossians 3.16. And so he talks about how we are to sing, how we are to sing. And he starts off with, what do we sing? And he says, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now, you may not know about this tiny book in the Bible. It's kind of in the middle. It's called Psalms. Um, there's about 150 of them, and there's a lot, obviously. It's not that small, actually. Take, think about it. Um, but this whole book of Psalms is a, is a prayer book. 
they were each designed songs for not only just individual worship, but also for communal worship, which what we do at chapel. And so when Paul says that we should sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, for Paul, that was his Bible. That was the thing that Jesus himself, when he walked on the earth, when he wanted to sing a worship song, he went to the psalms. That's what he sang. Now imagine if Jesus sings the psalms, we should probably be paying attention to them, don't you think? And so when Paul sings what do, talks about what do we sing, we should look to scripture to see what it says about our God. That is what we sing. That is where we pull from, should pull from, what we do in worship. How do we sing better? Obviously, um, Paul doesn't mean give us, per se, a music lesson of, okay, you do the scales, and then after that, then you say Jesus a couple times, and then there you go, your voice is perfect. Um, <laughs> but how do we sing better? And he says, let the word of Christ, Christ dwell in you richly. Meaning that if you want to sing better, if you want to sing more correctly in worship, know this. Know God's word. Why? Because it talks about who he is. Not only that, but for when, but for when you have the worst days come your way, for when your olden age in your mind is not your friend, there is this awesome thing that God made about music that we still are able to remember, even if our words can't. We can't speak with our actual mouths. God's words, scripture, through song, is still able to be remembered, to still be sung. So how do you want to sing better? Let God's word flow through you by knowing it, by spending time in it. Because not only will that help you to know what to sing, but when you see these songs, you'll be able to look through it through the lens of scripture, being like, um, I'm not sure this is actually a great song because it doesn't actually say anything about God. Or, yeah, it's great, but um, it doesn't actually paint a perfect picture, the right picture of our God, of Yahweh. No God's word. What do we sing together? Obviously, we should probably talk about what we should be singing when we're in, together, actually in a group. Because I could just tell you what to sing individually, but that gives us no help for when we're doing it here tonight. And all that worship should be is singing set, is Excuse me, singing, all that it is, is preaching set to music. You see, because not only when we sing together as a group, are we talking to God, are we singing to God, but actually we are singing to one another in the body. That these songs that we sing should be encouraging to us, reminding us of the truth, of who God is, but not only that, but who we are now in him, in Christ, alive, made new, new creation, redeemed. Singing. All that it is is preaching set to music. And that's directly, directly quoted from Sinclair Ferguson, so thanks to him. And now the last part in this verse is what notes do we sing? What notes should we be singing? And it says this, with gratitude in your hearts to God. Now this word gratitude, really, if you look at the ancient text again, is talking about grace. God's grace. When God's grace comes into your life, when you realize the grace that God shows you, it changes you. Honestly, if you have a real encounter with God's grace, you should not be the same. You should not be the same at all. So when it comes to the notes we sing, it should be completely seasoned and drenched in God's grace. Because once you're changed by God's grace, then you just can't help but sing. You just can't help sing about him to sing to your brother and sister in Christ and encourage them to let them know who God is. I wasn't sure if I was going to do this, but um, I think being honest also helps a lot, especially when connecting with the speaker. And as someone who wants to be a pastor one day, it kills me when I don't give God's word the time it deserves. It, is, it kills me when I don't give God the time he deserves with me to teach me and to show me what he wants me to say when it comes to times before anybody to speak his word. And if I'm honest, I did not give God the time he deserves, at least the small amount of time that I could give him that I was able, you know, would he be able to give to him? And so don't think that what I said tonight encapsulates everything of musical worship, of what we do on 
Monday night, Wednesday morning, Friday morning, Sunday morning. But I pray that this would be an encouraging for, thing for you to start researching yourself. Find out, okay, now I know what worship is. Or now I know why we sing through worship. Now I know maybe a little bit about how do we worship now? How do we sing? What do we sing? But don't think that I've encapsulated this entire mountain of a topic. I could be here until Jesus comes back, and I still would have scratched the surface of what God says about how we should be singing to him. But I pray that the gospel will put songs into your souls. That we are called to worship God through song. And truthfully, when we taste and see that the Lord is good, we just can't help but sing. Worship is so much more than singing. It is our entire life. It is a changed heart given to completely to God. We sing because God is worthy and holy, and we sing the truth of God in reaction to his great grace. So I pray that tonight would just be a starting point for you, for me, and just diving in, learning and knowing God more and more, and just giving him the praise that he deserves. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much this night. Lord, thank you so much that despite my failings, my failures, God, our failures, that your grace shines through, completely covers it. And I pray, God, that tonight would be a starting point for each and every one of us, Lord, that we would just can't help but just want to sing more, God. And I pray that even as we now finish out with one more song, um, that we just put into this practice just these very small, very small reminders, God, of your great truth, of how worthy you are of praise and just how great it is to sing to you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray all these things, amen.